For those of you who don't know me, my name is Dr. Munis Farouki. I'm the director of the Institute of South Asia Studies, this very space over here. And I also am a faculty person in the Department of South and Southeast Asian Studies. As you probably all know, today marks the 150th birth anniversary of Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi, a.k.a. Mahatma Gandhi. As you are well aware, the Mahatma is one of the great towering figures of the 20th century. As well as leading the charge against British colonial rule in India, Mahatma Gandhi offered the world crucial insights into how the weak and disempowered can resist overwhelming and oppressive might through non-violent struggle. His ideas deeply influenced everyone from Martin Luther King to Nelson Mandela to recent Nobel Peace Prize recipients like Malala Yousafzai and Kailash Satyarthi. His ideas also undergird many a contemporary struggle for political, social, economic, and environmental justice. Behind an unassuming and often shy personal manner, indeed, I believe Mahatma Gandhi greatly feared speaking in public, lay a man of indomitable will. This will, however, was complemented by extraordinary compassion and insight into human character. Nowhere is this more apparent than in his written word. Even if people know nothing about Gandhi's biography, they have often encountered the sayings in one form or another. These, to my mind at least, are not only memorable, but also offer a kind of easy insight into what made Gandhi tick. In that vein, allow me to share a handful of my favorite Gandhi quotes. And I'm quoting him here. You may never know what results come of your actions, but if you do nothing, there will be no results. <laughs> be the change that you want to see in the world. An eye for an eye will make the whole world blind. And my personal favorite, you must not lose faith in humanity. Humanity is like an ocean. If a few drops of the ocean are dirty, the ocean does not become dirty. Gandhi was not a flawless man, as we know from some of the protests outside today at the Gate, <laughs> but also from some of our history books. You have to look no further than his personal relations with his wife and sons, or his sometimes controversial experiments with young female devotees, or his clashes with Bhim Rao Ambedkar, M. N. Roy, and Subhash Chandra Bose. But even in his own lifetime, his opponents viewed him as approaching transcendent status. And his martyrdom in 1948 only hastened his induction into the pantheon of world greats. It is precisely this fact that makes Mahatma Gandhi impossible to ignore, even if you hate much of what he stood for. Indeed, you're probably best off co-opting him rather than fighting him. On that note, without any dose of skepticism or irony on my part, it gives me the greatest pleasure to welcome you to the first of four talks across this academic year aimed at commemorating Mahatma Gandhi's life and legacy. Today's speaker, the first in our series, is my Berkeley colleague, Professor John T. Barclay, an associate professor in the Department of History. Professor Barclay teaches courses that focus on the history of religion, feminist history, as well as politics and modern India. Speaking to Professor Barclay's wide-ranging intellectual interests, her published work has engaged everything from trying to contextualize global intellectual history to unpacking the complicated figure of Vinayak Damodar Savarkar, who's the chief ideologue of modern Hindu nationalism, to explorations into how classical Indian music traditions were dramatically reshaped from the late 19th century onward by emergent nationalist discourses. As well as the author of Two Men and Music, Nationalism in the Making of an Indian Classical Tradition, which was published by Oxford University Press in 2005, Professor Barclay is in the process of completing a study focused on the figure of Savarkar. Other writing projects include explorations of sedition, colonial surveillance, and the emergence of Hindu fundamentalism in the late 19th century. Prior to coming to Berkeley in 2013, Professor Barclay taught for 11 years at Columbia University. 
It is in fact at Columbia that Professor Barclay also got her PhD in history. And this was following an MA at the University of Pennsylvania in history and a BA um, in economics from the University of Bombay. Attesting Professor Barclay's wide-ranging career prior to becoming an academic, she also spent seven years in the world of academic publishing, working first at Temple University Press and then the University of Minnesota Press. Today's talk is titled Gandhi, Savarkar, and the Muslim Question. It is sponsored by the Sarah Kailath Chair of India Studies, the Center for Initiative on Political Conflict, Gender, and People's Rights, Race, and Gender, the Center for Middle Eastern Studies, the Center for British Studies, and the Department of History. And so without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Barclay to the podium. So my job is practically done with <laughs> Melissa's talk. No, I can just <coughs> go home. Anyway, thank you very much for inviting me to do this. It's a great pleasure for me to do it, um, but not least because Gandhi's chief interlocutor um, was B.D. Savankar, and about him I will tell you a little more than I would ordinarily want to, but because it's central to the question of the Muslim question. So I have 45 minutes, and so, you know, fasten your seatbelts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're in for a bumpy ride, and I'm going to make it, if I can, in 45. Thank you all for coming. All of you, I see a great many familiar faces, and I know midweek, mid-semester, a talk at 5 o'clock, you're all just probably ready to go get a glass of wine, and I'm very, very appreciative that all of you have shown up here to hear me speak. All right, here goes. So the decade of the 20s were a terrible time in India. By any account, a large part of the country was engulfed in what Ambedkar, writing retrospectively in 1940, noted was a civil war, this is what he called it, between Hindus and Muslims who had absolutely nothing in common and could never be brought together. In 1920, <coughs> there was the Mapla Rebellion in Malabar. 21 and 22, there were riots in Bengal and Punjab. 24, the publication of a pamphlet containing a virulent anti-Islamic poem generated riots in Koha. But even before that, in 24, there were riots in Delhi, in Nagpur, in Lahore, Lucknow, Muradabad, Bhagalpur, Gulbarga, Allahabad. 25 and 26, Calcutta, the United Provinces, the Central Provinces, Bombay Presidency. Lots of riots. Gujarat in 27, one case of temple desecration. And in 28, just between April and September, there were no fewer than 25 riots. Some took place because Ramlila was celebrated in the wrong place, some because music was played in front of a mosque, some because of cow slaughter. In 29 alone, there were 22 riots, and Ambedkar noted that it would not be much exaggeration to say, from writing from 1940, that it's a record of 20 years of civil war between the Hindus and Muslims in India. And he diagnosed why he thought Hindu-Muslim unity was a chimera. There is, among the Indians, he said, no passion for unity, no desire for fusion. There's no desire to have a common dress, no desire to have a common language. No will to give up what is local in particular for something which is common and national. A Gujarati takes pride in being a Gujarati, Maharashtrian in being a Maharashtrian. And such is the mentality of Hindus who accuse the Muslim of want of national feeling when he says, I'm a Muslim first and an Indian afterwards. Ambedkar kept going from a spiritual point of view. He said, Hindus and Muslims are not merely two classes or sects. They are two distinct species. In this view, he said, neither the Hindu nor the Muslim can be expected to recognize that humanity is an essential quality present in them both. There is nothing to bring them in one bosom. It's pretty damning. He writes this in 1940. Now, I'm rehearsing Ambedkar's writings here since it's rarely noted that his views were not, in many ways, dissimilar to Savarkar's. But of course, his target was the Hindu community and the divisiveness of caste. And ironically, on this issue, Ambedkar, Savarkar, and Jinnah were all in agreement that these were two nations at war, and the idea that these two could live under one umbrella was ludicrous. So this is the decade that I'm going to hang out in for the rest of my talk. A decade described by Ambedkar as one of civil war. It was also the decade of the Khilafat movement. 
And the Khilafat movement, in this paper I'm arguing, was a moment of crisis, a kind of Walter Benjamin flashpoint. And it forced leading nationalists to articulate strikingly different versions of secularism. I'm going to speak of two of them in this talk. Now, in recent years, secularism has taken a beating. It's taken a beating from the American academic left. It's taken a beating from the Indian right. And I will still suggest that the version of secularism that could triumph over those objections, both then and now, was Gandhi's. And on his 150th birthday, I'm going to try and recuperate some of that. The backdrop of the Khilafat movement and what it tells us about the Muslim question is how I'm going to try and recuperate Gandhi's secularism. For starters, why would Gandhi support the Khilafat movement? Why would he do that? It's not as if he supported everything Muslims demanded, but he put Khilafat front and center on the Indian National Congress's agenda with great insistence. In the years 1919 and 20, he kept up a correspondence with the Ali brothers, the leaders of the movement. He traveled nonstop. He gave speeches at colleges, at cow shelters. He wrote letters, editorials, essays in Gujarati about why Khilafat had to be supported. He did this even when his alliance with the Ali brothers was uneasy. Gandhi didn't support the Muslim League. He didn't support separate electorates. He did not always support Jinnah who became leader, obviously, as you know, of the All India Muslim League. And when Jinnah argued later for Muslim-majority states to become federating, he didn't support that either. But his support for Khilafat was unique. He supported it wholesale. And the point was not the restoration of the Khilafat as such, but something else that Gandhi made into a signature of his own understanding of how Hindus and Muslims needed to relate to each other in the Indian context. It allowed him, in other words, to argue for a uniquely Gandhian idea of a secular polity and society. The demand for the maintenance of the caliphate, far away in Turkey, presented Gandhi with the perfect Lockean moment. Here I speak of the letter on toleration. A minority community had expressed its views on the maintenance of an institution that was of tremendous symbolic importance to it but it threatened a conventional understanding of majority nationalism. And its seeming recidivism puzzled just about everyone. And yet, Gandhi supported it. Sarva Bhed Samabhav is how Gandhian secularism is understood, yes? It was not a loose multicultural secularism for him. It was a thorny concept, a concept of toleration with fundamental difference at its core. Not only did he not speak of a liberal sensibility, we're all alike, we're all entitled to the same things. He maintained, paradoxically, because with Gandhi there are always paradoxes, always, always paradoxes. He maintained the notion of two communities that were and needed to remain fundamentally different, incommensurate with each other. That very difference, seen as insurmountable by Ambedkar and dangerous by Savarkar, was at the heart of this secularism. Elsewhere, I've called it an indifferent secularism, rather than a motivated one or a marked one. And it's indifferent because difference remains. It stands on its own terms. It's not available for a liberal makeover. It's not available to the logic of proselytization or of subjugation by a minority to the dominant community. But it would be precisely that difference and because of that difference that Gandhi would press the majority community to extend itself stating expressly, and here's one of his principles, that all privileges were for the minority community. Only duties and responsibilities and no entitlements accrued to the majority community. Now, Savarkar, in his own way, was also a radical secularist. But it was also in response to Khilafat that he simply went off the rails never inclined to be favorable in his attitude towards Muslims, whom he'd represented earlier than 1924 as somewhat human. In his early writings, he had at least conceded that there were some good Muslims, whether the Emperor Akbar or warriors who'd fought in the rebellion of 1857. But in house arrest after 1924, which is of course when Khilafat is abolished and disallowed from participating in any political activities, he got around the ban by writing screed after screed after screed in Marathi, 
in newspapers which have all been published only in Marathi, not translated unfortunately, going after Gandhi, <coughs> going after the Khilafat, going after Muslims, or going after all three of them. Now those years after 24, mark not so much a turning point in his thinking as much as a rehearsal and then a refining of past extreme views. From that point on, Savarkar lost any of the measured tone that he might have earlier used about Muslims. And so it raises the question, why? Why? Why did the Khilafat movement so center Gandhi and so unhinge Savarkar? Why did it exacerbate his obsession with Gandhi? turning it into a sustained outrage about the leader he felt had not only stolen his thunder, but sold India down the river. So the Khilafat, in brief, I'm going to take a one minute romp through 1300 years. <laughs> and Khalifa and Theory, as all of you know, is the combined spiritual and administrative leader of the worldwide community of Muslims, Sunni Muslims in particular. This was not so unusual. By the fourth century, the Roman emperor was deemed the holy Roman emperor, the spiritual and administrative leader of the community of Christians. Khalifa ruled from Baghdad in theory since 750 AD under the Abbasid Caliphate. By the 10th century, it was difficult to provide unified political spiritual leadership. And between the 9th and the 11th centuries, Turkish speaking people arrived in various parts parts of the caliphate's boundaries. They settled in northeastern Iran, in western Afghanistan, central Asia, Baghdad's authority wanes. And all of this movement and expansion by Muslim potentates produced a problem, a problem that the most famous theologian of its time, Abu Hamid al-Ghazali, solved with a solution that maintained religious authority in the caliph without relinquishing the authority of a ruling dynasty. Any ruler could claim lawful status as a king, so long as he made formal acknowledgement of the caliph's theoretical authority in his reign. How? By including his name in the khutbah on minted coins. 1258 Mongol army sacked Baghdad and executed the reigning caliph, thereby extinguishing the formal sovereign authority, now allowing other leaders to lay claim for themselves as caliphs. Let's skip now to the last major Muslim empire left in the late 19th and into the early years of the 20th century. We're speaking now of the Ottomans. And the last remaining Sunni potentate and the only possible candidate, well, not the only possible candidate, but the candidate who lays claim to the title was Abdul Hamid II in 1877. Abdul Hamid's claim was challenged, not just by the British playing an emergent Arab nationalism against a dying Ottomanism, was challenged as well by Syrian and Egyptian contenders. George Birdwood, well known to art historians here, suggested that the caliphate be transferred to the Amir of Mecca. Damascus, Medina, Cairo, all were suggested by anti-Ottoman dissident groups who argued against the caliphate remaining with Abdul Hamid for three reasons. The first, with the legitimacy of his claim, the second of the grounds that he was corrupt, and thirdly, that the caliph should be Arab. The most holy of Muslim mitres, I suppose, was a little unsteady. But these political machinations notwithstanding, the Khilafat by itself was also a symbol, an idea, and a particularly potent one at that. Mona Hassan, in her recent work, I have to thank my students for suggesting that book to me, Saurav in particular, has shown that virtually from the moment that Baghdad was destroyed, a lost Khilafat is mourned, it's longed for, it's yearned for, in writing after writing, as the last glory of a glo golden epoch in which Muslims were safe, art and literature flourished, and piety was protected. The destruction, if you will, of the second Khilafat in 1924, by no less than the quote-unquote sword of Islam, one of Ataturk's sobriquets, sent shockwaves, bringing back acutely, according to Hassan, the sense of violence Mongol destruction had accomplished so many centuries earlier. Words to that effect suggesting that in abolishing the Khilafat, Ataturk had betrayed the trust placed in him by Muslims from Syria, India, Egypt, Palestine, Morocco, Albania, Bosnia, and intellectuals in Indonesia, Egypt, elsewhere, debated how to resurrect a modern Khilafat. One of those intellectuals, Mahmoud Barkatullah from Bhopal, published in 24, a little treatise simply entitled The Khilafat. I'm already 15 minutes into this, so I can't give you a great deal about Muhammad Barakatullah. I can in 
the Q&A if you would like to know. But for now, let me just say that he praised Mustafa Kemal and the Grand National Assembly for having abolished a 13th century long institution without bloodshed. But what next? The Khilafat needed to be resurrected, according to him. How? Could one just elect one? Simply accept Sharif Hussain of Mecca as the new one? Amir Amanullah Khan of Afghanistan? All these questions and more were pondered in print by him, and he had a startling solution, as well as a prescient recognition of the vulnerability of the widespread and far-flung Muslim community that no longer could claim the umbrella of the caliphate as protection. So what did Muhammad Barakatullah say? He said, let us organize the Muslims of the world under the spiritual leadership of the Khalifa for three objects in view. One, by the instinct of self-preservation, he said, we must hang together, otherwise we may be hanged separately. The second, we should try and persuade the Jews and the Christians through the divine word of the prophet to the policy of live and let live, and thereby avert calamity. In these two first proposal, note that Barkatullah recommends a simple organization in the name of self-protection to persuade others to simply let Muslims be. <coughs> And finally, let all the denominations of Islam take part in the election of the new Khalifa. No doubt this was tilting at windmills, but nonetheless, it gives you something of his intent. Why? So that the Khalifa, as the spiritual head of the Muslim world, will be able to mix with Muslims living under monarchies or republics and under Muslim governments or non-Muslim governments. And in that case, he can become a powerful agency for good to mankind through him, Old differences and animosities can be forgotten. Order can be restored in the place of prevailing chaos. Friendly relations between Muslims and the civilized world, that's what he called it, can be established. And thus, many of the impending conflicts among nations can be averted. <coughs> this view of a resurrected Khilafat was not Savarkar's. Nor was it the view of Shankar Nair, who was the past president of the INC, a virulent critic of Gandhi, who published Gandhi and Anarchy and attacked Gandhi in the preface. He didn't even wait for them. He just sort of went mm -hmm. after him right in the preface. Okay? Nothing shows the lack of statesmanship, he said, more than practically basing the claim for Swaraj on the Khilafat grievance. The Mohammedan religion, he wrote, had only produced a baneful result. And whatever the Hindus may mean by the Hindu-Muslim Antan, Muhammad Ali and Shaukat Ali, the leaders of the Khilafat movement, and those of their persuasion, mean a Muslim dominion, pure and simple, though they are, of course, clever enough to keep the cat in the bag for long. So Gandhi. Gandhi, as he was wont to do, and in the face of all of this disagreement, from Savarkar, from Ambedkar, from Shankar and Nair, even from Nehru, threw himself into the task of preserving the Khilafat. He took a position on it that baffled Nehru, it irritated Jinnah, was perhaps viewed cynically by Ambedkar and with sputtering rage by Savarkar. Ataturk was seen by Savarkar as rescuing Muslims from their own backwardness and forcing them into the modern age away from an inherent and endemic fanaticism. Against this, in Gandhi's letters and his correspondence of the period, we see something quite different. Through the decade, well, not through the decade, from 22 to 28, he's of course in prison, but 1919 to 22, and then afterwards, he wrote about Muslim politics. And over and over and over again, he wrote about Muslim grief, anguish, and pain at the sudden abolition of the Khilafah. And in typical Gandhi fashion, he would do something unpredictable, and that is he would link it to Karl Slaughter. He would link it to a hot button issue. Now, coming back from South Africa, it's possible that he understood the struggles of a minority community better than his compatriots in India. It is certainly clear that he understood and expressed as much the notion that for the non-urban and perhaps even the urban population of India, religiosity was not something you could separate from politics. And what is striking is how much he anticipated the grief, the yearning, the loss that Mona Hassan has written about, and about the affective hail of Khilafat for a population, or at least for a large part of the Muslim population. Semiotically sensitive and strategic, both of which are things we can say about Gandhi, always a few steps ahead of us, 
He understood that Khilafat was an ideal in reality. And in practical terms, it was no more than a voiced yearning for a golden age, supporting his Muslim brethren in this idea and ideal for Gandhi was vital. November 11, 1919, he made this clear. A gentleman, he wrote, had sent him a message, and I'm quoting now, to the effect that we should help the Muslims and the Khilafat issue only on condition that they stop killing cows. Here's Gandhi's response. There can be no point in giving help in expectation of a return. Our Muslim brethren have not sought our help in the issue of Khilafat. If, however, we want their friendship, if we regard them as our brethren, it is our duty to help them. If, as a result, they stop cow slaughter, that's a different matter. A week later, he gave a speech at the Khilafat conference in Delhi. And I can give you one example of this, but you have to take me on my word that there are many iterations of this in his writing. He spoke of the anguish of the loss of Khilafat for the Muslim community. And his sense that Hindus, by sharing in grief, in Muslim grief, should not believe that Muslims were therefore indebted to them. It has been said, wrote Gandhi, that Hindus have laid Muslims under a debt by sharing their feelings of sorrow and protest. I maintain they have done no more than their duty. The test of unity and real fraternal feeling lies in sharing one another's sorrow and happiness alike. How can 22 crore Hindus have peace and happiness if 8 crore of their Muslim brethren are torn in anguish? The pain of 8 crores is also the pain of the other 22 crore inhabitants of India. Anguish, 8 crores in anguish. This is not the language any other nationalist uses for this period or for the Khilafat movement. Not Nehru, not Jinnah, certainly not Ambedkar, and you will see what Sadhakar has to say. December 1920, he addressed a women's meeting in Patna. He did not mean, he did not mean not to be clearly understood. He begged Hindu and Muslim women not to consider themselves each other's enemies, but he clarified things. It was reported in the searchlight, he did not mean that the two should be one. This is where I said, Gandhi is no liberal here. It's not, there's not, we're all the same. He did not mean that Hindus should take to reading and believing in the Quran, giving up the study of and believing in the Vedas and Shastras, nor that the Muslims should discard the Quran and begin studying and believing in the Hindu Shastras and Vedas. Every one of them should remain firm to their religion. And here, here's a paradox with Gandhi. As there could be no marriage between a brother and sister, but all the same they could love one another, so Hindus and Muslims also should have love and respect for each other. The objections to this are obvious, but this is how he put it. You know? I would say this is perhaps Gandhi's clearest statement on toleration. Why would I say that? I'll get to that. To ensure that everyone understood that he too was a Sanatani Hindu, that he was Hindu, this is what he said at a Goshala in Betia in 1920. He'd founded it in 1917 for infirm cows when he'd gone there for the Champaran thing. For infirm and diseased cows <laughs> in 1917. And he goes back to it. He goes back to Bitya in 1920. And then he says, cow protection is the outward form of Hinduism. I refuse to call anyone a Hindu if he is not willing to lay down his life in this cause. It is dearer to me than my very life. Anyone who studies Gandhi knows that the paradoxes and contradictions are never far behind anything he says. However, if cow slaughter, he says, were for the Muslims a religious duty, like saying namaz, I would have had to tell them that I must fight against them. But it is not a religious duty for them. And here's the clincher. We have made it one by our attitude to them. Okay? We have made it one by our attitude towards them. Whereas Muslims slaughter cows only occasionally for beef, I'm just going to give you a little bit that I'd actually told myself I wouldn't, but I will. <laughs> the English, he said, cannot do without it for a single day. And yet we submit to them as slaves. Okay. 1920 in the same year, he said, if we want to save Hinduism, I say, for God's sake, do not seek to bargain with the Muslims. My alliance with the Hindu brothers is one of honor. I feel that I'm on my honor. The whole of Hinduism is on its honor. 
And if it will not be found wanting, it will do its duty towards the Muslims of India. And then he snapped at somebody. He said, ask me not today what about the cow? Having just told us, right, that it was the outward form of Hinduism. Ask me not today <coughs> what about the cow? Ask me after Islam is vindicated through India. Unlike Savarkar, to whom I will turn presently, Khilafat had nothing to do with political sovereignty for him. A year before his imprisonment, in 21, he gave a speech in a village in the Khera district of Gujarat. He spoke about why he'd had a change of heart, why he had once believed, as anyone who reads Gandhi knows that hubris is not very far behind either. He had once believed he could reform the British government, but he'd given up that hope. So why? He said it had revealed itself, I'm quoting, to be a Ravan by attacking Islam and betraying the Muslims. He'd lost faith, he said, in this Ravan government because of its calculated betrayal of Islam. And finally, he said, you cannot save the cow by killing Muslims or Englishmen. You can save her only by offering your own dear neck. The Quran does not insist that Muslims must eat beef. It is not prohibited beef, that is all. I am associating with the Muslims with this faith, and I tell all sadhus that if they sacrifice their all for the sake of Khilafat, they will have done a great thing for the protection of Hinduism. The duty of every Hindu today is to save Islam from danger. So he stipulated, in effect, a moral and political equivalence between what he held to be two religious first principles, cow slaughter and khilafat. But he was very clear that the majority group had to take on the Muslims' burden as their own in order to maintain India as their own home. Gandhi's secularism did not pay lip service to difference, so much as it insisted that that difference was real, so real that Gandhi would even speak, as I've just told you, of Hindus and Muslims as brothers and sisters and therefore unable to intermarry. But because na for Gandhi, nationalism was always primarily about people and never about territory, Khilafat had nothing to do with political sovereignty. Finally, one last quote from him. He supported Khilafat, he said, not despite his being a Hindu, but because of it. I have sold myself to the Muslims without demanding a price, and I ask each and every Hindu to do the same. I know that the Khilafat agitation is not a political weapon. It is the duty of all Muslims to defend the Khilafat. Of course, fighting for the Khilafat will increase the power of Islam. It is no crime to rejoice at this. The Muslims cannot but be glad. And if we wish that people of other faiths should be happy at the awakening of a new spirit in Hinduism, we should also be glad at the regeneration of Islam. So this was precisely the rhetoric that would send Savarkar's antagonist off the rails into paroxysms of rage upon his return from the ambulance. Minutes, how much time do I have? Um, 20 minutes. Mm. So I might make it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Elsewhere, in a reading of Savarkar's pamphlet called Essentials of Hindutva, I've spoken of the obsessive love affair Savarkar believed everyone, but in particular everyone Hindu, normatively needed to conduct with India if they wished to live there. What he was unable to see was that the same love he wished all Indians, Hindus primarily, but others as well, to hold normatively for India might be akin, might be akin to the love that Muslims might have for the idea of Khilafat, if not for the actual politics. But from 27, far more than his previous writings, his prose takes on a violent and extreme tone, bordering even on incitement. In a piece on the Khilafat, entitled, He Khilafat Marje Ahedari Kai, there's one Marathi speaker here, I think. <laughs> yes, are there any others? Okay. He Khilafat Marje Ahedari Kai. Right? The sarcasm in just this title is clear. What is this thing okay, called Savarkar, called Khilafat? Well, that's my Freudian, <laughs> <laughs> Freudian take up to the phone. What is this thing called Savarkar? True. In piece after piece after piece, he would write of Muslims in the language of theft. They'd stolen money. They stole Hindu women. And they were conspiring to steal sovereignty. Abdul Hamid II had been invited to come to India as the Khalifa by them. Okay. And he insisted the Khalifa is not a sadhu. The Khilafat Sultani Ahe, Raja Satta Ahe. Okay. The 
Khalif, the Khilafat was a Sultani, it was a Raja Sattah. Mm -hmm. And the sole reason that Hindi Muslims, this is what he called every Hindu who disagreed with him, okay, a Hindi Muslim. The sole reason that Hindi Muslims want him here is to halt the work of Hindu Sangharta. So Khilafat, in other words, had nothing to do with feelings, yearnings, longings, affect, loss, nostalgia, nor was it symbolic, nor was it an ideal, an aspiration. For Savalkar, it was ISIS, and that was it. <laughs> and all he had was suspicion towards this surreptitious sovereignty that was slithering its way into Hindu India about Lakhorupe, which he notes again and again and again, an enormous amount of money being stolen by Bhopal's Muslims, by Hyderabad's Muslims, and all Muslims from the Nizam of Hyderabad to Shaukat Ali were complicit in a conspiracy of which ignorant Hindus had no knowledge. The Khalifa, he noted, was uniquely dangerous. He was not the Christian Pope, who was a toothless, I don't know why he thought he was toothless, but <laughs> he thought he was toothless. Maybe he was being metaphorical. <laughs> a toothless ascetic, airless, disarmed, symbolic soldier who had no political power. Khalifa was like Troy's wooden horse, and unscrupulous mullahs and maulvis who were otherwise very well aware of the disunity between Shia and Sunni were liable to bring it in. In an exemplary paragraph, negatively exemplary paragraph, from this piece, He Khilafat Munje Ahitari Kai, Savarkar mocks, mocks Muslims. Because it's Gandhi's birthday, I didn't want to give you all of the horrible things he says. I'm going to give you a few so that you get some sense, however. But this is is sort of very, very much the way Savarkar would write about Muslims. He says, when crafty mullahs tried to convert Hindus, this is my translation, he wrote in Marathi, I'm giving you my translation. It's much worse in Marathi, I should note. When crafty mullahs tried to convert Hindus to Islam by claiming that there was no caste among Muslims, then he tells Hindus, if he's a Shia, he should be asked, Hazrat Andhe Khan, okay, Andha is blind, right? right. Hazrat Andhe Khan, why then do you not acknowledge anyone other than Ali's immediate descendants as your Imam? And if he's Sunni, then he should be asked, Bhondumiya, why does the Khalifa have to be of Quraysh descent? When Gandhi saw anguish, Savarkar saw a surreptitious Muslim takeover. Savarkar again, the first principle of Sunnis is that Khalifa has to be sovereign and independent. And he wants Satta, governing power. And it must be independent Satta. And who is that Khalifa? The Amir of Afghanistan. And in every chawl, in every tenement, in every hut, he said, the anticipation of this Musalmani Amir who was going to descend to India was being fanned by the likes of Muhammad and Shaukat Ali. And in what would become a drum roll, he said, Swarajya hereafter means Muslim Rajya. Muslim Rajya. He said in Marathi, I'm going, to, I'm going to say it in Marathi and then I will, I will translate it. Muslimanti ji zari hi asli khilafat, tari hindun var kosar nari ti ahe nivar afat. Keval apati. Muslimanti ti zari asli khilafat, tari hindun var kosar nari ti ahe nivar afat. Keval apati. Even if it is just a khilafat for Muslims, for Hindus, it is a catastrophe that is going to break on them like rushing water. From Matla to Khilafat and thereafter, in his writings, Muslims rioted solely for political power. It's not enough that Muslims were depicted by him as treacherous and ungrateful. He added cowardice and deception to their long list of negative attributes. In the 20s, when Gandhi was in jail, Savarkar slung mud with great relish at Muslims. In this case, at a fictional Muslim laughing at the plight of the abduction of Hindu girls. He warns his caricature of this gleeful Muslim that a Hindu is on his way. Okay. Last week, I'm translating now, because I think I have only 10 minutes. A Bengali youth named Shashi Mohan finished the matter, he says. He killed him, this Muslim, this unnamed Muslim. Are you hearing this, Rahim Chacha, he asks. I clip now, Rahim Chacha. He is the result of your lascivious laughter your lecherous smirk in your beard. Listen, listen well, Rahim Chacha, to what Shashi Mohan said. And now he's ventriloquizing Shashi Mohan. I killed him to
To defend the honor of my Hindu sisters, Satitva, I destroyed the Rakshas. He goes on to those fanatical thugs. He actually calls them Dharmavede, which is just sort of intoxicated by religion, Dharmavede. To those fanatical thugs who leeringly laugh and lust after Hindu women, Shashi Mohan is the first Hindu response. Rahim Chacha, at least now come to your senses. Because in response to your every lustful giggle hereafter, there will be a Shashi Mohani response, he said. So let's fast forward a little bit. If Muslims were so dangerous and indeed a separate nation, why then would Savarkar object to their leaving and forming their own state? Ambedkar found his logic on this subject puzzling, described it as queer and illogical. But here is Savarkar's secular position as Ambedkar recounted it from his memory. In his scheme, in Savarkar's scheme, a Muslim is to have no advantage which a Hindu does not have, one to one majority rule. Minority is to be no justification for privilege, and majority is to be no ground for penalty. The state will guarantee the Muslims any defined measure of political power in the form of Muslim religion and culture, but it will not guarantee secured seats in the legislature or in the administration, and if such guarantee is insisted upon, such guaranteed quota is not to extend beyond their proportion to the general population. Thus, noted Ambedkar, by confiscating its weightages, Savarkar would even strip the Muslims of all the political privileges it had secured up until then. Yeah. So where Gandhi held that the majority should have only duties, only duties and responsibilities, and no entitlements, Savarkar held that the minority should have only duties and no entitlements. These are radically different conceptions of what a minority should have access to. In 1944, three years before independence, an American war correspondent named Tom Treanor interviewed Savarkar. Why was he able to in 44? He was able to because Savarkar was one of the few political leaders not in jail. <laughs> he was not in jail because the Hindu Mahasabha had held itself aloof from the Quit India movement. Gandhi was in jail, Nehru was in jail, everyone was in jail, but Savarkar was not. Trinar describes a Savarkar who was interested in ideas and clear on how he perceived the place of Muslims in India. He was asked by Trinar in the course of the interview how he planned <coughs> to treat the Mohammedans. It's an interesting sign that even in 1944, they're using the word Mohammedans, but that's another question. Edward hadn't written his book by then, until then. Savarkar's response to this question was, as a minority in the position of your Negroes. To Trina's follow-up question about what might happen if the Mohammedans succeed in seceding and set up their own country, Savarkar promised, waggling, as Trina remembered, a menacing figure, that as in your country, there will be civil war. And civil war there was. Now on Gandhi's birthday, I haven't talked about his birth, but I am going to talk about his death. It was precisely for the views that he held, a very small portion of which I was able to give you today. And Savarkar's incitements to violence, a very small portion of which I was able to give you today that Nathuram Godse not just murdered Gandhi, but gloated about it. In his correspondence with Patel, Nehru was in no doubt that Savarkar had his hands all over the assassination. I'm arguing that it had its roots in Khilafat and Gandhi's support. Gandhi supported the Khilafat, which Savarkar would see as a fundamental betrayal of India's national mission. It was a terrible foreshadowing of the reasons for and the ways in which Gandhi's extraordinary proposals about what secularism in India could and should mean have been upended and replaced by the kinds of views Savarkar developed in reaction to Khilafat. Two kinds of secularism, one genuinely liberatory that I've called an indifferent secularism because it let difference stand on its own terms. 
the other violent, deadly. When right-wing critics of secularism claim Savarkar as their spokesperson, they repeat this fateful and ultimately disastrous changing of the ideological guard from Gandhi to Savarkar. And when left-wing critics of secularism bash it, they miss the most obvious truth, that Gandhi's theory of secularism, I would argue, continues to provide a charter that would encompass the need to acknowledge the reality of religious difference, but in the context of understanding how Gandhi could still be the model, flaws and all, paradoxes and all, for an enlightened ethics of toleration that could at once be secular and profoundly accepting of the powerful role of religion in our political, social, and cultural life. Moments. Mm -hmm. So I'll open the floor to questions, Bob. Question, uh, you know, with regard to Savarkar's, you know, resistance to essentially partition mm -hmm. and, and the idea of a, of a civil war ensuing, uh, but wasn't that partly because of his notion of this kind of, not exactly religious, but this notion of his punya bhumi? In other words, that there was a sort of holy land that belonged to the Hindus and that giving up part of that land would be some desecration. Isn't that part of it? Yes, that's part of it. But, uh, you know, I, As I, I'll quote to you yeah. later. But he actually writes in 1924 in some of these pieces in Marathi that were not published or not translated, mm -hmm. that we were in the midst of a race war, he said. Mm -hmm. We're in the midst of a race war, and we need to win it. Mm -hmm. But the other thing about partition which is, which is striking is um, that he doesn't, he doesn't support partition, of course, but what he truly believed, or at least he wrote it, who knows what he believed, he wrote, that Muslims needed to stay in India, subjugated, that they could not go off to somewhere else. They had to stay in India, subjugated. Okay. Mm. Um, but at the same time, he's still reasonably sure that they constitute a completely separate nation who are trying to steal political sovereignty away. So the Matrabhumi, Purnyabhumi, Matrabhumi is, of course, the case. Mm. But that, I think, he argued more in terms of laying claim to the idea that every Hindu who did not take their Hinduism from the Vedas was also a Hindu. And every Hindu who broke away from the Vedas, who broke away from or broke away to anything, Shaivism, Vaishnavism, Tantrism, Buddhism, anything, that was more a kind of colonizing move on his part. On the question of partition, he's very clear that the Muslims needed to stay as a minority with no rights. Only they couldn't peace. take pieces of the punya bumi with they them. They couldn't. No, no. But you're the, right in that. The other thing is that the you know the uh, up until now the, the the notion of formal secularism as it has has existed up until near the, the present uh, is sort of like the Gandhian one, isn't it? Uh, you know, it's the, the term they use is this dharma nirapekshata. Mm. You know, there's indifference mm. to religion, which is more like Gandhi's, you know, sarvabha or samabha mm. uh, notion that you know let everybody be and and don't enforce any particular, at least in theory, not in practice. Of course, you know there have been all kinds of uh, divergences from that, but that was carried over, and now the the right is, has attacked that. Uh, Yes, I would agree with that. Yeah. I would simply say that what the sort of you certainly the Modi government, but not just the Modi government, mm. has has put in place <coughs> is a marked secularism. Secularism, mm. because I don't think secularism is identical with itself mm. any more than I think atheism is identical with itself. I think there are Muslim atheists and Christian atheists, and, mm. and I think that in India, what we have certainly today is a much more of a kind of marked motivated secularism. The indifference, I think, was an ideal, I'm arguing, to bring it back in some ways. Mm -hmm. uh, but to bring it back in ways that, that the curiosity here is that Gandhi actually makes no kind of argument about the Khilafat in historical terms, in philosophical terms. He just makes it on the grounds that we have to recognize that if it matters to this extent to the Muslim community, then we have to take it on board as our pain, as ours. 
It's not an argument for or against the Khilafat. They could have been arguing for anything, the maintenance of anything, and Gandhi would have taken it on board. Yes. And that's what I mean in some ways by an indifferent secularism, that it's not saying, well, you know, we're going to agree with you on the Khilafat, and that's why we're going to support you. Gandhi, of course, had another kind of argument for it, which was that Gandhi will write in other places that their claim is just, and it is just because it was what was promised to them and a promise was broken by the British. And so if there is a broken promise, you have to support them. But Gandhi is not sort of getting into what the Khilafat is. Why should it mean something to them? It's just, it means something to them. It is central to their religion, and we must support them. And so that's what I'm calling a sort of unmarked, indifferent secularism, because it's not subject to the logic of, well, isn't this not really the correct thing to do? Because, you know, if Ataturk has abolished it in 1924, why are you? None of that. You see none of that in Gandhi's writings. You see it in Nehru's, mm. you see it certainly in Savarkar's, you see it in other people as well. But you don't see it in Gandhi's. What you see in Gandhi, and this is what was striking for me, and this was striking particularly, uh, where is Saurav? Saurav is here. So where, yeah, uh, after reading Mona Hassan's Longing for the Lost Caliphate, um, that this sort of narrative of grief, anguish, loss, is something that Gandhi seems to have understood in ways that made him seem hopelessly out of date in his time. Hopelessly out of date, because Ataturk was so celebrated. Mm -hmm. And yet, I think he wasn't. Mm -hmm. no? mm -hmm. Yes? Um, Malia, hi. Hi. Um, so why is, uh, because you've spent a lot of time with his Marathi writers. Mm. Uh, now, I wanted to get a sense from you. Uh, how do they compare stylistically and in terms of content in his English writings that some of us are obviously a little familiar with? Gandhi's or Savarkar's? Uh, Savarkar's, right? Because uh, yeah. essential to the Dukkha, for instance, has a, this is logic in his text on it, right? There's this particular kind of structure it has in a scheme, and I'm wondering how the Marathi writings compare yeah. to Yeah. And secondly, what's the reception of his Marathi mm. writings in his own lifetime? Mm. Very good questions. Questions that I've been struggling with now for quite some time. His Marathi writings, are riven with sarcasm. But it's a very particular kind of sarcasm. It is a Puna sarcasm, shall we say, a Puneri sarcasm. Yeah? It is the Puneri sarcasm, Leela Dhar is shaking his head. It's the Puneri sarcasm of a, let me give you a couple of examples. Um, so, a couple of things that I could say about Puneri sarcasm. Leela Dhar, correct me if I'm wrong. Is that you go to somebody's house, you knock on their door in Pune. Obviously, it doesn't happen with every single person. And you knock on their door, the door opens, and you say, hello, how are you? And what would be the response? Aati rarat, ki bahira tu bharai Right? Everyone who speaks Marathi understood what I said. Are you planning to come in, or is it your intention just to wait outside? For the <laughs> now, that pervades, pervades a certain kind of writing which in Marathi is called Saretor, right? And Puna, Brahmin Marathi is particularly like that. So, so does it translate into English? It doesn't. And that's you know, the task of the translator. It's very difficult, you know, very difficult. David Shulman wrote a wonderful piece about Raman in uh, the New York Review of Books about yeah. his translation abilities. And I have great envy for that ability to translate because it's very difficult to translate sarcasm in a language that is particularly given for it. Uh, you know, Marathi is particularly given for this kind of writing into English. So that's the first thing, that the English doesn't, doesn't quite do it justice. The second about the reception, you know, that's a very difficult question to answer. So the piece that I am, he khilafat manje ahe was written somewhere between 24 and 26. We don't know when it was written, but we know that it was written in his own hand. How did it circulate? Um, the only place that I've been able to find any real evidence of circulation, because remember, this is all in the world of something that we would today call vanity publishing, right? in small house after small house after small house, in places like Bhagur and Nashik and Amreshwar in Makchan. I had to look up where Makchan was. Okay? In, in, in all of these small towns, you can find, I found, 
all of these little tracts that are published at the local printer, and then they are distributed. Um, how do you locate his reception? His reception, underground certainly from 24 to 37, because he was under house arrest and barred from doing any active political work. So what did he do? He wrote it in the form of plays. He wrote, continued to write poetry. That poetry circulated. Uh, but it's a difficult circulation to nail down. And part of the, the question for me is how to identify the travel, if you will, in the region of this core narrative. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I'm borrowing from is a fellow, so, well, not fellow sociologist, but a colleague from Berkeley, Arlie Hochschild, who wrote this wonderful book called Strangers in Their Own Land. Mm -hmm. And in Strangers in Their Own Land, she goes to Louisiana. She spends, I think, four years there. And she's interested in finding out why a predominantly working class community, which should, in some ways, be supportive or supportive of the Democrats and, say, labor unions, why does that move to, to Donald Trump? And at the end of that book, she has something that she calls a core story, a deep story, I'm sorry, a deep story. And she makes up this kind of story, which she then tests with everybody. So that's my next task. I'm going to make up that core story and actually use some of the political science tools to test it. But not in Bombay and not in Pune, because all of the little tracts that are written by about Savarkar, and there are I mean, 200, 300 of these, all repeating the same story about Savarkar, they're printed in, in sort of not even second order cities. They're printed in Makchan, in Amneshwar, in places like Bhagur, where there isn't very much. Um, and so that's sort of the task of reception. I think I answered your question, right? Did I answer? Were you asking me or how his, his literature was received by others? Is, no, not him. I did answer your question. Oh, yeah. So in the 1930s, yeah. when Savarkar was writing, yeah. um, fascism was being, like, was a huge um, political development mm. in mm. So to what extent did that influence his views on the so-called Muslim question? I think he had those views long before he read any fascist literature. I mean, it's, um, you know, it's very <coughs> clear to me that, now he doesn't write that <coughs> much, okay, the founders of the RSS, Hegdewar, Golwalkar, uh, they write much more about the fascists in Germany. Savarkar doesn't write about the fascists in Germany, he doesn't need to, he's producing his own literature, okay, he's, he's, I mean, you know, if you have any interest in it, I can give you several pieces in which he will write about the Hindu race that needs to protect itself. He doesn't write of Muslims in the same language. Okay? He doesn't write of, of, of sort of the contamination by blood. But he will definitely use the language of blood about the Hindus themselves, that they are all of one kind of blood. Is it, you know, what would he have said? Savarkar's hero, if you will, any country that's a hero, was not Germany. It was not. Bizarrely, it was America. Okay, he saw America as the sort of uh, place in which science and technology flourished. I don't know if you can see this, but you know, even in these, now this, this little thing, which is called Sputlik, right, which is just various of his um, writings, is, it was published by his nephew, published by gathering a bit of money. And you see on the back of it, right, what you have. And this you will find in almost every one of Savarkar's little tracks, a rocket ship going off a satellite. So he was sort of very enamored of science and technology. And so his sort of aspiration for India was, was, was certainly not England, but it was America. Yeah? Yeah. Um, I have a question about uh, Gandhi's views on the collapse movement. Yeah. Um, why did he not use it as an opportunity to draw more Muslims into the IMC? Why? Why did he see it as grief that the Hindu community should take on instead of trying to mediate it or trying to find a solution in India that could unite the two of them? Well, first of all, in the decade of the 20s, 1922, just you know this history, I'm sure, but by March 1922, he's in prison. Yeah? And March 1922 to 28, he's in prison. And he comes out in 29, and it's a different situation <coughs> at that point. The INC does actually 
go after trying to bring more Muslims into the Indian Nat National Congress. It's Nehru's program to bring, it's called the Muslim Mass Contact Campaign. Um, but, you know, just recall that 1919, Gandhi hasn't been back in India for that long. Right? He's just back, he came back in 1914. For the first year, he was told by his uh, mentor, Gokhale, to zip it up and travel. So he zips it up and he travels, and then he breaks his 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 sort of silence um, at the at the sort of promotion ceremony, I think, for Banaras Hindu University. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and at that point, when he breaks his silence, he's most people think he's he's just he's a kook, right? They think he's a kook after that one. In fact, it is widely deemed as political suicide what Gandhi is doing, but he knew South Africa, but he doesn't know India. The Indian National Congress, that's not really an answer to your question, but let, here's the answer to your question, is that the kinds of politics that you're talking about, why does he not bring more Muslims into the Indian National Congress? The Indian National Congress is not that important for Gandhi. Okay, that's the first thing. He actually thinks it should abandon its role as a political agitator and become a social organizational group, right? Doing social reform, going out into the villages. It's a curious thing that he, holds no political office, none. I mean, he's president of the INC once, okay? and he hands it over. He's president of the INC once. He holds no political office, and yet okay, he is of tremendous importance. Why does he not bring Muslims over into the INC? It's not his agenda. His agenda at that point is solely to support Muhammad and Shaukat Ali in their quest because it means so much. He's paradoxical and quixotic. I don't have complete answers for him, you know, for for you on him, but that's one answer. Yeah. Now the twenties are the years, by the way, in which the International Congress sees its Muslim participation dip. Okay. That and there's a <coughs> terrific book on that by Gyan Pandey. Okay. His first book that you can take a look up. That'll explain it more than I can. Yeah. So one question, the general there, and then, uh, sorry, the next. So please, go ahead. Yes. Oh, okay. Osama. Yes. Oh, um, I'm going to cower now. No, no, Did no, I get no, something no, wrong no, with the Khilafat? No, 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 <laughs> no, no, it's about the, this question. In, in the way you frame the talk, so I can see the contrast between the two, the yeah. in Ghana and Sawakar, and the latter comes out as you describe them, mm. awful and evil mm. and terrible, especially in terms of the, the politics of today. Yeah. But wha why, why describe Gandhi as, uh, in the way you describe the, the quotations you provide, it's more a communal secularism. Mm. It's one thing, rather mm. than an indifferent secularism. But maybe I don't understand mm. the term. But the second point is, isn't that just a symbolic politics? I mean, in other words, this is a symbolic concession that he's making. There's no actual political concession that he's making by saying we need to feel the pain of the Muslims. How is that different from Bill Clinton or George Bush or any mm. other president who do, I mean, obviously there's a different context, mm. but who also pretend to have, I mean, I'm not saying Gandhi is pretending, but you should have saying a symbolic concession because it's precisely because it's not territorial or sovereign or political. But you see, <coughs> you know, this is the same Gandhi who would say if it matters that much to the Muslims, okay, hand the whole country over to Jinnah. But he knows the fabric on the other. But you see, this is the thing, is that it's difficult for me to say that this is just symbolic. And the reason that it's difficult for me to say that it is just symbolic is because that is what all the others are doing. Okay, that, that kind of lip service, less, yes, we must pay some attention to the Muslim demand. Lip service is paid by a number of other <coughs> nationalists. In, in all of the manifold contradictions, Gandhi doesn't just talk the talk, he does walk the walk, right? Um, and when he says that the cow is as dear to me as it is, I would sacrifice, I've got more quotes, he said, or you can take, I, 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 I'll paraphrase it, he says, I would sacrifice my wife, my friends, and my children for the cow. And yet, yet, I will not put it <coughs> forward yeah. as a transactional element. So in some ways, my reading of Gandhi is that what he demands is always much more difficult than anybody can produce, right? And he makes similar demands on the question of caste, which are very, very paradoxical. Not that you have to change the law, not because the law won't accomplish anything. 
This we can admit to, right? A law prohibiting racism doesn't eradicate it, obviously. But that what you need is a fundamental transformation, a fundamental transformation of perhaps of consciousness. And without it, all of the rest is, if you will, a kind of liberal change. Yeah. I don't think Bill Clinton ever felt the pain of Muslims the way down. That's really not fair. I mean, forget I don't think George Bush felt any pain, okay, <laughs> about bombing Iraq. <coughs> but with Gandhi, right, the measure of his authenticity, I think, can be seen in the things that he will do mm -hmm. in a riot torn decade, or in, in the 40s, what he will do. And you know, when he's written off as, as a geezer who is completely out of touch, he's the only one who can calm cities down. Only mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. He's the only one who calms Calcutta down. He's the only one who can, you know. There, there is no doubt that his support of Khilafat puzzled everybody. Right? And it's puzzled me for a while. Why on earth would he? Because if the restoration of the Khilafat was yet, that was doomed. That was doomed. It was doomed in 1920, presumably. And by 1924, from what I understand, Mustafa Kemal takes a revolver and puts it on the balustrade, right, and gets rid of it once and for all. So there are other symbolic battles that he could fight. But this one, he's supporting them in what is a doomed battle. His support never wanes. It's not as if, you know, and the Khilafat movement goes off in other directions. It goes off in certainly, quote unquote, violent directions. Support just never wanes. So for that reason, I think I would grant him a little bit. On the communal secularism, that's a good point, And I've sort of wrestled with that. Because, and, and I, I don't have a clear enough answer for you, right? And I didn't want to call it communal secularism just because of the baggage the term carries with it <laughs> in the context of Indian history, mm -hmm. right? A primordial antagonism. And Gandhi's fighting that one, precisely <coughs> fighting that primordial antagonism. But he's not trying to erase the difference. He's not telling Muslims, this is not the secularism of the Uniform Civil Code. This is not laissez-faire, right? This is a kind of much, much more profound regard um, for something that I think a lot of secular historians have not paid enough attention to. Ranjit Guha has repeatedly wrapped us on our knuckles by saying this when he wrote, you know, religiosity is central to peasant subjectivity, for instance. I think Gandhi is extending that by, by recognizing its hold and, and letting that difference be. He doesn't try to change or convert <coughs> either them or the Hindu population. Now, you could fault him for this, and Ambedkar certainly does, right? But that's why I called it indifferent, and I don't call it communal. Yeah? Yes? Um, thank you. Adam. Uh, two questions, you can take either of them, they're both more indications. One, I'm... Okay, then I'll just take one. I'm stuck <laughs> for thinking about the Gandhi's notion of political friendship and this, mm. and how that relates to friend-enemy distinction, or how we see those two. And you can completely dodge that, because the other one... Wait, wait, repeat the question, that's interesting. So Gandhi's I'm idea of, a, of friendship, yeah. the precondition to political anything, political yeah, difference yeah, yeah, can be yeah. different, social difference can be contained within political friendship. And I'm wondering if that is not somehow Schmidtian in a, in a, a progressive, ex I know, so you can dodge it, a progressive extension of that bound of friendship, of the friend-enemy line beyond which it's possible to kill, to have violence. And so if, if Gandhi is suggesting by wrapping the Muslim on and demands for Khilafat at an affectual level inside a community of friendship, is he not taking Schmidtian political theology in a, in a progressive sort of way. Second one. I don't know. How do you take Schmidtian philosophy in a progressive sort of way? I'm asking you. I don't think you can. I think I'd flip it around. You see, because in this sense, it's, it's similar to the question I was asked about, why does Gandhi not actually try and bring Muslims into the Indian National Congress? But that's a certain conception of politics we've got, right, for the 1920s. That's not his conception of politics. In that sense, you know, the Indian National Congress is to a large extent irrelevant in this case. So if there were to be that kind of politics, I wouldn't say that 
the pot, well, I would flip how you started saying it. Okay, what's the second question? Then take, I would invite you to take us to March, February, March 1922, Ooh. and the moment when he calls off yeah. on cooperation, and specifically the, the perspective then from the, the OTRs in Gorakhpur of his demands for Kilap, right? They're burning a police tana and proclaiming yeah. Gandhi Maharaj. How do they see this other... How do the OTRs see Khilafat? Yeah, how, I don't how, does, know. how does his demand for a Khilafat, for support of the Khilafat movement, which will annoy the hell out of civil society and politics in that vein, how do those actually fall on the ears of those same peasants who would proclaim Gandhi Maharaj? The peasants that are cannot be divorced from religious consideration, mm. that, that must pray. Well, I don't know how it was received by the OTRs. Okay, OTR is the word for volunteer, volunteer then it becomes OTRs. Okay. Um, so he's very clear about 1922 and why he calls off nonviolent non cooperation. Right? It just went in the wrong direction. You can't burn down a police station in my name. Hmm. Hubris, I concede to you completely. Gandhi and hubris, I concede completely. How this would have been received. So if I follow Gandhi in 1919, 1920, 1921 through four volumes of his writings, okay, some part of what I've told you, some part of what I've quoted for you, he is saying in places like Bhitya, presumably to people who would have been Otiyas, okay, and in all of them, village to village, city to city, he goes, his, his itinerary is exhausting. Just reading where he goes in one month, in one month, how many times he speaks is exhausting. But in all of them, Adam, in all of them, he's saying the same thing. Okay? Cow slaughter. Cows are, you know, the outward form of Hinduism. He says this repeatedly. You cannot protect the cow. You cannot protect the cow by killing Muslims. You can only protect Hinduism by offering your own neck. So to that extent, I would say that willy-nilly, and despite the fact that he will come to dislike being called Mahatma, he does this kind of almost messianic um, preaching, if you will. Yeah? Village to village, small town to small town, in the, in the railways, all over as much of India as he can. How is that reacted to? Well, I mean, I would have to go back and check whether there were riots that accompanied what he said. As far as I know, there weren't. Okay. So as far as I know, in 1919, 1920, when he's in Pabna and he's in Bhagalpur and he's here and there, saying both of these things, right? It is every Hindu's duty to, to support the Muslims <laughs> in their quest for the Khilafat. And it cannot be transactional if they decide, by the way, to give up cow slaughter, that's fine, but we're not demanding it. I would have to assume that those OTRs had created an image, as Shahid Amin tells us, of who he was. And because of that image, they listened. Okay. Whether they, did they agree with it? That I don't know. But I can at least tell you that it's not clear to me that there were violent responses to what he said, even with that. Well, the, the discourse is not a purely Daily urban level that with him, him engaging Savarkar. Oh, no. Right. No, no, no. He's paying no attention to Savarkar. Okay? The thing is that Gandhi was the ghost that hovered over Savarkar. Savarkar was not the ghost that hovered over Gandhi. Okay? Sorry. Yes? Sorry. Sorry. So by 1920s, Gandhi is a national leader and he's mm. writing, and uh, like 1922, um, he's writing and he's throwing all over India. And here is someone who is writing in Marathi mm -hmm. and from a tiny village in Maharashtra. No, 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 he's writing in Ratnagiri. Oh, Ratnagiri. Ah, okay. so 1924, he's not in the tiny village. Yeah. So he's in Ratnagiri, so he's writing, mm -hmm. he's writing in Marathi. So mm -hmm. definitely his surplus is like mm -hmm. unlimited. Mm -hmm. So how do you see Sabarkar in 1920s? Is he kind of like, do you see him as part of a long tradition of Maharashtra and revolutionary terms like that in that movie? Uh, or do you see him as a politician, like, you know, is, is it a kind of region versus nation mm, uh, tension mm, mm, or something mm, else? Mm. No, definitely not region versus nation. 
you know, hubris seems to be the common feature among all of these nationalists, right? So, I mean, it's like each one of them writes as if he and he alone knows what the nation needs. Um, so Savak is not <coughs> writing in that sense just for Maharashtrians, because his works are almost simultaneously sort of being translated into Hindi. Okay, post the RSS founding, his works get translated into Hindi. Remember, the RSS m is founded in Maharashtra and then moves north, right? Um, his works are surreptitiously and piecemeal published in RSS publications. How do I see him? Do I see him as in a long line of Maharashtrian revolutionaries? No. No. I mean, I don't see him as part of, say, I would think of the Maharashtrian revolutionaries as the Varkari Pant, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. As genuine revolutionaries. I see Savarkar as, as, as somebody who, um, who sees himself on par in 1924 with Gandhi, with Nehru, with every other politician of that time. And the fact that it is almost natural that from 1924 to 1937, the Hindu Mahasabha, by the way, has also got its branch in Ratnagiri, right? The Hindu Mahasabha, I think, in those years, founds a branch in Ratnagiri. It's not founded in Ratnagiri, but it has a big branch in Ratnagiri. And so in those years, he is just very busy um, with doing two things. Okay. One is the Shuddhi Sangharkan thing, which the British tolerate because it's not considered political. And then he's doing these other things like Zhunka Bhakri, kinds of um, events, shall we say, in which he's trying to persuade everyone to eat okay, what is or what, what might have been considered a slightly more rustic food. Okay, Zhunka and Bhakri, which is like a or Bhakri's millet, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Millet, and it's like a rougher, yeah. rougher roti with some dry um, garlic chutney. Yeah. Um, and so he's doing those kinds of things and encouraging his wife uh, to have uh, very Brahmin ceremonies and invite all, all lots of other non non Brahmins over for Haldi Kunku ceremonies and things like that. So he sees himself as a reformer. Okay? He sees himself as on par with Gandhi. He sees himself as on par with Nehru. And he writes as if he is on par. More to the point, he's, he's treated as if he were one okay, by, by any. This, these are the people that I was telling you about in Amneshwar and Bhagur and Nashik and so on and so forth. That he's certainly treated as a leader who just needs to take his rightful place. And in 1937, he does. Yeah. You get the last question. You mentioned something which is, uh, I think I have to uh, allude to. My mother tongue is Gujarati, mm. so I carry a special burden of 2002. Yeah. And what is so impressive is the Gandhi's insistence on an emotional. Yes. That is, and the anguish that one mm. feels today since the 5th of August. Mm. And one doesn't know when that will end. And it's the anguish is even deeper because it is very popular. Yes. And your it comments, is your comments on uh, uh, the victory in 2014 was greeted as a liberation after yeah. a thousand years. Yeah. Which is also a historical. Yes. Do you have any comments? <sighs> Do you know, I read uh, Narendra Modi's editorial. Oh my God. Why and I thought, how published? is this possible today in the New York Times? But why did they accept it? And I thought, well, this is interesting because he's had, you know, he's the one doing this to Savarkar's picture mm -hmm. and incorporating Gandhi. That itself is a shame that you can't do both. In the center of Europe, yeah, but you can't do both in this case, not after. Because I don't think Narendra Modi would believe that the pain of Muslims is the pain of the majority community in India. Um, nor would I think Narendra Modi or the BJP um, think that the Muslims should be anything other than what Savarkar believes yes. that they should be, yes? And so the idea that Narendra Modi is recuperating Gandhi in the New York Times of all places, just, just, um, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I, I haven't had time to read the comments. I go through. I think it's absurd that the editors of the New York Times accepted this. Office. Well, he's a this world leader, so I no, guess no, if he's they, a world they leader, they, they, judgment. No. Well, they don't need to. Uh, he's, he's anointed by the New York Times.
editorial. Not an editorial, I'm sorry. No, no, it was an op-ed. Op yes. 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 It wasn't. Yes, so the editorial speaks for me. Yes, yes, it's not an editorial. Yes. Thank you so much. Please join me in thanking